Good morning, everyone. If you're visiting with us, we especially want to welcome you today. We see a good number of visitors here. Uh, so happy to have you here with us. I'm a little bit biased, but there's one, um, well, I won't call her a visitor, but one uh, future new member, new member already. I'm not sure how we tally these things up. I suppose I should ask the elders. My, my niece, this is her first Sunday here at worship, uh, Eden George. Very happy for that. And don't clap too loudly. I'm sure she's sleeping. Okay, don't wake her up. All right. Yeah, Kenna gave me a look like, what are you doing? Uh, well, it is good to be up here. Good to see all of you. I've been gone. I've been gone at uh, Harding University all week at uh, a program called the Caruso Experience. That's a, a Greek word for, it's a preacher training camp is what it is for, for high school aged boys. We do it every year for the 4th of July week. Uh, I'll tell you all about it, but I, I slipped away one day for lunch with my grandfather who lives in in El Paso, just between BB and Bologna, slipped away to have lunch with him, uh, and we didn't really consider this when we planned lunch. We just said Thursday. Well, we didn't think it was the 4th of July, and so we drove around to eight restaurants trying to find a place that was open for lunch and settled on the Chinese buffet in BB, which was about as good as it sounds, and um, bless their hearts. We we're having lunch. Grandfather, my grandfather was a, vet, a veteran. He served in Korea. was a battle skills instructor for many years after that. I, I said, hey, granddad, thank you, you know, for your service. It's the 4th of July. What are, what are you, an 88-year-old veteran, going to do to celebrate? And he said, well, son, just about the only day that's special to me anymore is Sunday. I thought there was a lot of wisdom in that. So happy 4th of July to all of you, and thank you especially to those of you who have served in our armed forces, who have helped protect this country. And I also think that for Granddad, perhaps that was just an excuse to go to bed early on the 4th of, on the 4th of July. Well, like I said, I was away all week at Harding University at the Caruso Experience program that our very own Elijah King has done the last couple of years. We weren't able to get him there this year, but maybe he uh, has learned all there is to learn about preaching by now. Yeah. Uh, or he will by the time this sermon's done this morning. This year we had 51 students who gathered on the campus in Searcy, Arkansas to learn, to study, and to preach the Word of God. 51 students from six different states who got up Friday shaking in their little shoes to preach their fledgling little five-minute sermons. And I know what you're thinking, five-minute sermons? That sounds great. Hey, not this morning, okay. It's low-tech Sunday, but it's not low-effort Sunday as far as I'm concerned. Now, this year we were studying the book of James with these high school boys, the book of James. And it's not lost on me that smack dab in the middle of the book of James is a passage that says not many of you should become teachers. And the reason for that, which we'll look at in just a moment from James chapter 3, is that, let's face it, our words can get us into trouble. In fact, it's so easy to say things that we ought not to say and to not say the things that we should say. Anybody else in here this morning struggle with a little syndrome that I call foot and mouth syndrome? Yeah, not foot and mouth disease or hand and foot. My, my brother-in-law is a doctor, not me. I'm not sure, but I struggle with, that is, saying things that I shouldn't say and then after the fact having to pull somebody aside and say, hey, I really shouldn't have said that. In fact, it's happened to me this very week. Well, I guess it's Sunday, so uh, it's a new week. Praise the Lord for that. In fact, just a couple of days ago, while I was on the campus of Harding, I ran into Asa Fowler. Asa, who uh, is a counselor at Honors Symposium, a different camp that's happening on the campus of Harding this week. I popped over. He was sitting with some of the other counselors and students from Honors Symposium, and I just wanted to... Um, to catch up a little bit with him, just have a little bit of small talk. Uh, he's not around here a whole lot anymore. I was happy to see him, um, proud of the work that he's doing. And so I opened my big mouth, and that's when I really wish that I hadn't. See, I never did honor symposium. I only know about it through Rebecca, who was a, a counselor at, at this particular camp. So apparently I knew some, some insider secrets that the campers didn't yet know. So the first thing I say to him is, Hey, Asa, have you guys already gone and done... This so-and-so thing, I won't spoil it for those of you who, who might be willing to go now, at some point in the future. And I mentioned a, a secret, top secret field trip that they were about to be taking. And he looked up at me and Ace's poor eyes, they got as big as watermelons. And he looked at me and he did a gesture that many people make to me quite often. A little number that looks like this. 
And he looked back down and he was scrambling and sweating and wiping the sweat out of his face and trying to think about how to recover from this for the hole that I had dug us into. And some of the students are saying, yeah, Asa, what's that? Hey, what's that? And he said, yeah, we already did that. Blah, 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 blah. And he tried to change the subject. And then I just kind of stood there awkwardly in silence. Everyone looking at me like, what have you done? And I said, well, I'm going to walk away now. Bye. You see, I eventually had to go back and apologize because, of course, I had spoiled a little secret. You see, this happens to many of us, doesn't it? Sometimes we say things we ought not to say. Sometimes it's innocent like this. Other times, not so much, is it? Sometimes our temper gets the better of us and, and something just flares up and boils out. And then before we know it, we said something that might just be irreparable in a relationship. The song that we just sang, which I just learned, Lee, is not called Angry Words. Thank you for that reminder. How long did it take you to figure that one out as you thumbed through the songbook this week? A little while, a little while. And the song highlights the fact that sometimes our words can cause irreparable damage to a relationship. Let's love one another and have our words be gently spoken instead. In fact, one of the activities we do at this preacher training camp is we teach the, the boys how to get up and speak in front of people. Every night, they get one minute to answer a question, often a tough question that causes them to open up a little bit, be vulnerable, talk about what it is for them to grow in their faith and to be men of God. Midway through the week, as we had studied James 3, we asked them the toughest question of the week, tell us about a time when you have hurt someone with your words. Even the counselors have to participate. I myself am not exempt. And at the end of the night, listening to these students open up their hearts and try to wrestle with the fact that they often say things that they shouldn't, don't always surround themselves with the right influences, many of them who think they can get away with it until a moment like this when they're exposed in front of the preachers at preacher training camp. I myself had to get up and say, hey guys, sometimes I say things that I shouldn't. And as a preacher, someone who's, who's been patted on the back for, for saying things that can inspire and provoke, sometimes, well, you get somebody who's sleeping on the second row, and so you think, well, maybe I'll say something a little bit more provocative so as to wake them up. There was someone yesterday, well, I gave my closing banquet speech, a student who, bless his heart, probably didn't sleep all week, dressed to the nines in his bow tie, asleep on the second row. I thought I had a pretty good speech, if I do say so myself. You see, sometimes my words can get me into trouble because I think maybe if I just amp it up a notch, my jokes can be a little bit too pointed. Perhaps it was living in Massachusetts or perhaps I should just accept the blame that sometimes I can be a little bit too blunt, too critical, too outrageous in order to get a reaction. Brothers and sisters, our words can hurt. But the good news is that God's word encourages us to use our words to honor God and it warns us of the misuse of our words. Would you open up with me to James chapter 3 this morning? James chapter 3. It's low-tech Sunday, so grab a real Bible, okay, if you can find one. If you don't have one, go ask your grandma, okay, and I'm sure she brought hers. Uh, James chapter 3. We'll begin in verse 1. The irony of this passage is not lost on me after having trained 51 preacher boys all week. But we, we grappled with this text. We really did. James chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, God's word says this. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, set on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. 
For every kind of beast and bird, reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. And before James moves on to talk about a more productive way to use our words, which is to pray for wisdom, you see, of course, he's pulled out all the stops here in this passage, right in the heart of his letter, hasn't he? All the stops. I, don't, I can't think of any stronger worded passage in the entire Bible to describe something that's set on fire by hell. Do you think James wants to drive this point home to the church or what? It seems as if he could have written this right here and right now in 2024 in America, couldn't he? Our words can do some serious damage, brothers and sisters. You see, our words can be hurtful. Let's face it. Our damage, uh, the, the damage that our words can be immense, the damage that they can do can be tremendous. I can still remember, what about you? Some of the hurtful things that people have said to me over the years, some of them very pointed, insults, perfectly crafted, something that somebody had stayed up all night trying to think, oh, that'll get him. And yet other times it's just been something that flew off the tip of someone's tongue, something they said without meaning to really hurt me. It just kind of came out. Perhaps they forgot about it five minutes later, but I haven't. All these years later, and by the grace of God, well, perhaps it'll help me to have some thicker skin. Uh, this is not to give anyone ideas as to what to do after the sermon, okay, this morning. That's not the point. You ever heard the expression, sticks and stones may break my bones, but what? Words can never hurt me. Brothers and sisters, that's not what it says in the word of God. Even if it rhymes, that doesn't make it true, okay? No, the word of God tells us that our words ought to be taken seriously because they can do some serious damage because James doesn't just say that our words can do damage to others. Did you notice? James was saying that our words can do damage to us can't they? He was saying that our tongue is like that rudder on a ship, like the bit in the mouth of a horse, that our words can get out in front of us and they can steer us. You see, the kind of speech that we have dictates the kind of life that we'll live. The Bible says that your words can steer you in the wrong direction. They can not only hurt others, but they can hurt you. What if I told you, and this is me preaching to the chief of sinners here, okay, that not every idea or opinion has to be said out loud. And I know what you're thinking. Well, I don't say it out loud. I post it on Facebook. Well, maybe, maybe perhaps we can sit on some of those as well. At the end of the day, sometimes the solution is simply silence. And sometimes the solution is substitution. You see, James doesn't just talk about the danger that our words can do, set ablaze by such a great fire like, like the fire of hell itself. You see, James also talks about the fact that we are made in the likeness of God. We're made in the likeness of God. Our words, though they have destructive potential, they have positive potential as well, don't they? I've saved a handful of encouraging cards that I've received over the years in ministry. Yes, I've unfortunately hung on to some of the, the really sharp criticisms that I've received, but more importantly, I've got a little special drawer of the handful of encouragement cards that I've received from people who've told me what a difference I've made in their lives. These kinds of encouraging words that every now and then I open up the drawer trying to find a, a Father's Day card or something, and I find these, and they keep me going. Just a couple of days ago, we informed one of our preacher boys that he had been selected to speak at the banquet. 51 students preach. One of them gets the honor of speaking at the banquet. It's a high honor for these Caruso students. It helps that it comes with a little scholarship attached to it. I'm sure that's part of it. One of these boys who's come year after year after year from Mississippi, well, let's face it, I didn't think he had it in him. 
I told one of his friends as much. I said, hey, I really think that you're probably the, the front runner going into, into the, um, the banquet speeches. And uh, little did I know that his friend was sitting right behind him. Once again, foot and mouth syndrome, okay? And he says, Jared, that's low-key disrespectful. And he said, actually, it's high-key disrespectful. And once again, I said, I think I'm just going to stop talking because this ditch seems to be getting deeper. And I said, I walked away. And this student, Justin, was selected to speak. In fact, he's going to be preaching that sermon at his home congregation today. And I'm proud of him for that. And when we as the counselors surrounded him to inform him he had been selected. Now, this is a guy who's got a tough exterior. He's going to be playing college football this fall, in fact. I mean, hey, he's a man's man. He's a leader of his little pack that comes with him from Mississippi. When we told him that he had been selected, he was the perfect example of what we wanted to see in a Caruso student. In his demeanor, the way that he, he, he treated the younger students, helped mentor and tutor them on their sermons. And then, of course, the quality of his sermon as well. He broke down in tears. And he engulfed his youth minister in a hug like I had never seen before. And I stepped away. I said, I don't need any of this hugging business, all right? He said, those words to him meant something. That we had seen what he had done, and we were proud of him. I hope those words stick with him for a long time. In fact, this week, one of the students who's become a counselor. He started as a, a, a preacher student in high school. Now he's a colleague. He's a youth minister himself these days. We were just catching up right before the end of the week, and he said, Jared, yeah, I'm just so thankful for our friendship. He says, I want to be like you when I grow up. And I said, I'm not, I don't have that much gray hair. Okay, I'm not that much older than you. But he told me that I was his role model. And that means something. Do you have people like that in your life? Can you cherish those words? Can you speak those kinds of words into other people's lives this week? Will you use your speech to be a blessing? Because brothers and sisters, the world is listening. The world is watching, but they're also listening. You see, I realized after that, I should probably pay a little closer attention to the kind of jokes I'm telling, the kinds of remarks I would make, the kinds of criticism that I would give, because our words are a responsibility, aren't they? Brothers and sisters, remember, you never know who's listening. Brothers and sisters, we have the power with our words to compel people to good works. To say, hey, I saw what you were doing for this widow in our congregation. I'm proud of you for that. Hey, I see what you're doing. I saw the way that you helped that kid. That's the kind of example that we need in our church. You see, our words have the power to compel people to good works. Our words have the power to steer people on the right track. Have you ever had somebody step in your life and tell you something that you needed to hear, even if it's not what you wanted to hear? I can remember those moments like it was yesterday. What about you? Our words have the power to steer people on the right track. Our words have the power to shine light into the darkness. In a dark world, and we show up on Monday at the water cooler, what if instead of complaining about the presidential debate, we instead shared what we experienced at worship on Sunday? Our words have the power to pick people up when they're down, to encourage people when they're struggling. Our words have the power to sometimes even provide new information that can change people's opinions. It might seem like that's impossible, but it's not if we say it with love. And we have the right relationship. Our words have the power even to reshape people's realities. As we continue to encourage and pour into people and to speak life into their lives, perhaps their world will begin to change because we ourselves are made in the image of God and have been given speech imbued upon us by the Creator. Can I give you a challenge this morning? You up for a challenge? We didn't just come here to this, sing the old songs out of the songbook. That's been great. I've enjoyed that. I'm going to give you some homework, okay? I've been, hey, I've been on a college campus all week. I'm, it, it's what I'm used to. I'm going to ask that before you leave here today, that you'll say a word of encouragement to one of your brothers or sisters in Christ. And it can't be me, okay? It can't be me. Would you stop? Before you walk out the door, would you just say something kind to somebody? It can be something as simple as, hey, I'm thankful for you. It might be something as detailed as, hey, you know what? Here's a gift that I see in you. I want to encourage you to continue to use that to the glory of God. Maybe it's even somebody that you don't know real well. 
And you need to try to get to know them better and say, hey, I'm, I don't know you real well, but I'm thankful that you're here today. And hey, even if you don't fulfill the homework while you're here, by the end of the week, will you shoot somebody a text? Once again, it, it can't be me. My phone is broken. I'm working on it, okay? It's been a crazy summer. Would you encourage one of your brothers or sisters in Christ? You see, the dichotomy b- between our words here and in, in our church building when we gather for worship and our words at home, James highlights this and says, but we can't continue to praise God when we gather together with brothers and sisters in Christ and then go out into the workplace and disparage people, to curse people. That is to say, oh, you know, those types of people, that's everything that's wrong with the world. Let's measure our insults and our criticism just a little bit more this week to the glory of God. You see, when we come to worship and sing, praise God from whom all blessings flow, and then we go back to work and call our bosses bad names behind their backs, we render our worship null and void. James takes this seriously. He pulls no punches. Perhaps we let ourselves off the hook a little too easily. Well, the good news this morning is when you can't control your tongue, you're in good company. James says that this is a universal struggle. In fact, he says sometimes it even feels hopeless to control it. But then he goes on to say, but we can pray for wisdom, brothers and sisters. God wants to imbue us with the self-control that's necessary, in fact, to accomplish this great task. Because, brothers and sisters, our words can hurt. The very first year of our preacher training camp, we, we called it the Caruso Experiment rather than the Caruso Experience because we did not know what we were doing. We had put together an itinerary and a checklist, and we had reserved some buses and some cafeteria food and dorm rooms, and we just hoped that God would take it from there, and boy, did he ever. That soul speak activity the very first year, the very same question was posed to them. Tell us about a time when your words hurt someone. That very first year, a student from Houston, Texas, Dakai was his name. He got up with tears in his eyes and he said, well, there was one night when I got into an argument with my mama. And I got so heated, I got so upset that I said, I just, I wish you would drop dead. And I found her on the floor the next morning. She'd had a heart attack. This poor kid was going around feeling as if he had killed her with his words. And we surrounded him in prayer and said, it's not your fault, brother. Thank you for sharing that with us. But you've got to let yourself off the hook for that one. Well, the next kid got up after him. Clyde from Memphis talked about how his dad was a drug dealer. One night, he, his dad had been using and, and, and he, he, he let it fly. And he said to his dad, why don't you just get on out of here? And his dad high on something or other, ended up beating Clyde's mother that night. He felt as if his words had gotten his mother into trouble. And then after that, Corbin gets up, and Corbin talks about how he has a little brother with Down syndrome. And and the night before he came to preacher training camp, he got up. His brother was in his room bugging him while he was trying to pack his suitcase. And his temper flared, and he said to his little brother, I wish that you weren't my brother. Oh, and he could just watch his brother's countenance fall. His hero, it just cursed him. And he broke down before us, his brothers in Christ, and said, I'm just so heartbroken over what I said to my brother. And this is where we encouraged him to say this. You see, if you're struggling with this sin, your words getting you into trouble, saying things that you ought not to say, your temper getting the best of you, and something just flying off your tongue, well, you're in good company. But perhaps if you've been struggling with this and you're you're just not making progress, it seems like this inevitable uphill battle and you can never quite get traction. Well, perhaps what you need to do this morning is bring your need before the church and to say, I can't do this on my own any longer. This can't remain a secret sin. I need to drag it out into the light and I need your help. I need your prayers. I need your encouragement and I need somebody to hold me accountable. Be better men and women of God because brothers and sisters, you never know who's listening. Or perhaps you've been struggling with this, keeping it a secret, hoping it'll get better, hoping it'll go away. I hate to break it to you, but you'll never be able to conquer this sin or any other by sheer willpower. The only way to turn a serious corner concerning a bad habit in your spiritual life is by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. That Holy Spirit is gifted through the waters of baptism, When you lay your life down and say, 
I'm broken. I'm flawed. And I need Christ to remake my broken life. I need to be made new in the image of God. Well, that opportunity is available to you this morning. Though we will commute to Green Valley uh, due to some, uh, some concerns with the stained glass, okay? But that's certainly not going to stand in our way. Brothers and sisters, our words are powerful because we're made in the image of God, aren't we? We serve a God who spoke the universe into existence. He said, let there be light, and there was. The Son of God, then, who came and was in the midst of a storm, so, so bad, in fact, that the disciples said, Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? And he said, peace, be still. And the waves were still. This God, who can speak the universe into existence and can silence the storm with but a word, is the same God that has given you the capacity for speech, for good or for evil. And it's the same God who, when we come face to face with our sinfulness and we feel like we can never turn this corner, never conquer this sin, we're reminded of the same gracious words that he spoke from the cross. Powerful words, brothers and sisters. Father, please forgive them for they know not what they do. If you're struggling with this sin or with any other and you need the help of the church or perhaps you need to put the Lord on in baptism, why don't you come now as we stand and sing?